This lecture is the second portion of the lecture on stem internal organization. In the first portion, we talked about the apical meristem. Here, we will talk about how stems are organized in cross-section, starting with dicot stems that have not undergone secondary growth. We will then contrast that with monocots, and we will talk about what happens to dicot stems when they do undergo secondary growth. The image here shows a dicot herbaceous stem. That is a stem that has not expanded outward and made wood. We can see that there's several different structures here, and we are going to talk about what each one is, and then we will also talk about how they are organized. Let's start on the outside with the epidermis. You should recall from what you know already that the epidermis is the outermost layer um, of tissue on a plant. And it is not clearly differentiable here. Nonetheless, you can see that whatever's on the outside must form the epidermis. The next region in is going to be the region between the vascular bundle, which is this sort of pizza-shaped region circled here, and the epidermis. Anything between that is defined as being part of the cortex. Our next region in is the vascular bundle, and this is going to contain tissues that you are already familiar with, uh, namely xylem and phloem. You can see that there are several of those laid out in a circle around the stem. Within that circle is a region of fairly large parenchyma cells. This region is the pith. We'll talk about each of these regions and what they do now. The epidermis, um, as we've said in previous lectures, provides protection. It is going to reduce water loss. It is also going to be a barrier to stop things like herbivores or fungi or bacteria from getting into the plant. Remember that the epidermis is going to make a layer of cudin and wax that will help to waterproof it. The next layer in is many cells thick, and it is going to have some different cell types that have different functions. So remember, this is the cortex. The cortex will contain parenchyma cells. The ones very close to the outside are often green. They're green here, but that's false color. Um, they would be green, nonetheless, in real living tissue. That's because that they contain chlorophyll, and chloroplasts, and they can perform photosynthesis. There will also be parenchyma cells, like perhaps these, that are performing a storage function, storing water or other nutrients. Then there are going to be support cells within the cortex. These can include cholenchyma. Remember, cholenchyma is used as support while stems elongate. In this particular plant, the cholenchyma cells are the ones that are closest to the outside, just underneath the epidermis. They are staining green in this preparation. There also can be sclerenchyma fibers. Remember that sclerenchyma only forms when elongation is complete, and the advantage of sclerenchyma is that it is stronger than cholenchyma. On this particular stem, we see these red stained cells just inside of the cholenchyma. These are the sclerenchyma fibers. We'll now move on to talking about the pith. Remember the pith is the section in the center of the stem inside the vascular bundles. These are parenchyma cells and they can store defensive compounds. They can also store a variety of other compounds such as water, sugar, and other organic substances. So we skipped over the vascular bundles when we talked about the pith. Let's go back and talk about them now. The vascular bundles, of course, contain xylem and phloem. The xylem is always arranged closer to the center of the stem within each bundle, and the phloem is always arranged further out towards the edge of the stem. Within the xylem, you can see vessel members, which you should recall 
are going to be the cells specialized for conducting water. They are going to be large and have thick secondary cell walls, and so they are easily seen. And you can see several of them in the cross section shown here. There will also be tracheids and some associated parenchyma cells. If we move out to this region closer to the edge of the stem, we can see the phloem. And in the phloem, there will be sieve members as well as companion cells. We can see those a little bit more clearly when we look at vascular bundles in corn, which we will do soon. Finally, there's usually a region at the very outside of the vascular bundle that is a fiber cap. So the fibers are true sclerenchyma, and they are there to protect the vascular bundle from damage from the outside of the stem. In this case, it's not super clear whether they're here, but the region where the uh, cap would be is circled and labeled. There's a small region that we skipped between the xylem and phloem. We'll go back and talk about that now. It's labeled here as the cambium. It doesn't look like much. It's a thin band of very small cells. And the reason that they are small cells is that they are meristematic. Um, so you know that meristematic means that these are cells that are going to divide to allow growth to occur. And the cambium is going to allow two kinds of new cells to be formed. The cells that divide from this cambium towards the inside of the stem are going to contribute new xylem. Those that divide towards the outside of the stem will contribute new phloem. Since we are adding both to the inside and to the outside, this means that the stem is going to widen. And so the vascular cambium is what allows us to have secondary growth. Vascular cambium will result in indeterminate growth, meaning that the stem can widen indefinitely, at least in theory. Obviously, there's some practical limitations that mean no stem will actually widen forever. While we are talking about vascular bundles, I should point out that they go sort of up near the middle of the stem and they never reach the edges. However, leaves are going to be connected to the edges of the stem. So we need to think about how do the vascular bundles attach to the leaves. Your reading talks about the role of leaf and bud traces, and it talks about what specifically within the plant they connect, and what parts of the stem are crossed to accomplish this. So make sure you get that information from your reading. The vascular bundles that we just looked at were in a dicot. The organization is actually pretty similar in a monocot, but there's a couple of differences and this will also allow us to review the features. So here we're looking at the vascular bundle of corn, and this was in the title slide of the lecture. So generally the organization is the same. The orientation here is similar. Within this vascular bundle, the top of it is going to be closer to the edge of the stem. The bottom of it is going to be closer to the middle of the stem. You can see the xylem is at the bottom, indicating that xylem is closer to the stem's middle, phloem is closer to the edge. Within the xylem, you can see that there are some smaller cells, which are either sclerids or fibers, and then there are some large cells, which are vessel members. There's a few of them here. Within the phloem, you can see that there are larger and smaller cells. The larger cells are the sieve members, or sieve cells, which are the ones that are doing the long-distance transport. The smaller cell associated with each is a companion cell. There's also some, uh, probably additional parenchyma mixed in here too. We specified in the last slide that there's usually a fiber cap at the end closest to the edge of the um, stem, and you can see the fiber cap up here at the very top of this vascular bundle. However, in monocots, there's also a fibrous cap at the very bottom, so closer to the middle of the stem within each vascular bundle, 
and that's going to confer the stem extra support. Finally, you can see under this blue circle, there's a ring the entire way around the vascular bundle of these cells with the thickened secondary cell walls in red. And so these are all fiber cells. And that means that there's a ring of fiber cells the whole way around the vascular bundle in monocots. This ring is called the bundle sheath. And that too will give extra support. So there's a couple of differences that we just talked about. Oh, I'm going to go back for a second. There's one more important thing to mention. There's something missing in this um, vascular bundle that was in the dicot vascular bundle. That is, there is no vascular cambium. So if this were a dicot, there would be a thin row of cells bisecting this, maybe like so, and that is absent here. So that's going to be important because that's one clue that monocots are not going to engage in secondary growth to widen their stems. Now let's look at the arrangement of vascular bundles in dicots compared to monocots. The dicot organization is shown schematically at left. You can see there's about seven or so vascular bundles arranged in one concentric ring in the dicot stem. In the monocot stem, the situation is different. It looks like there's a almost random scatter of vascular bundles. In each case, the xylem, the darker area, is closer to the stem center, the phloem closer to the edge, but the location of the bundles themselves seems almost random. Mathematicians tell us it's not random, there's actually some complex patterns going on here. But in practice, what's important for us is that for any particular vascular bundle, there is almost always going to be some other vascular bundle between it and the edge of the stem, or between it and the center of the stem. This is important because it means that even if these vascular bundles did have cambiums, they would not be able to engage in secondary growth. As the ones, let's say, in the center tried to grow, they would simply be pushing new cells out towards areas where there were already vascular bundles held in place. So the new cells that were made wouldn't have any space to expand into. In the dicot stem, because there's a concentric ring and exactly one concentric ring of bundles, then when the cambium, which are these white cells shown here, when those cells divide and make daughter cells to the inside or outside, then the stem is able to expand to um, create space for the new cells. And so dicots are capable of secondary growth. So we've been talking about monocot and dicot stems. We can specify that gymnosperm stems, so things like pine trees or spruces, let's say, um, as well as most dicot stems are able to expand laterally. Uh, we just gave the reasons for that. What are the implications of it? First, a wider stem is going to be able to support a taller plant. So all else being equal, we would expect dicot trees and gymnosperm trees to be taller than most monocots, and that is in fact the case. Additionally, being able to create new xylem and new phloem means that as the old phloem gets old um, and either gets clogged or gets uh, air pockets, this would apply either to the phloem or to the xylem, as those two systems fail, the plant can make more vascular tissue to replace it. This is then going to allow the plants to be long-lived and to be able to continue growing even as problems arise. We've said now that dicot stems can do secondary growth. I should specify they don't all do this. Herbaceous plants are not going to substantially have stems that substantially grow laterally. But other stems, especially woody stems, will do this. So when the vascular cambium creates new xylem and new phloem, we're going to call that secondary xylem and secondary phloem. 
Initially, this is going to be just inside the vascular bundles, but pretty quickly, those um, new cells are going to expand and form complete rings the whole way around the stem. In this picture here, you can see there's a complete ring of xylem right here and a complete ring of phloem just above it right here. As you look at the picture, you should also notice that there are fibers both interspersed in the xylem, but especially interspersed in the phloem. You can see, um, especially in the phloem, this is obvious, there's a mix of fibers along with the secondary sieve member cells themselves. So let's look at the parts of this stem which we have labeled. In the center of the stem, we still have the pith. And that's going to be the same. You can see these are large cells, thin cell walls. This is still parenchyma tissue um, that has not changed. But now we can see all of this new xylem. We can also see the new phloem that we've pointed out. Out here a little bit further, you see these sections of red. These are the fibrous caps on the outside of the vascular bundles. Those initial vascular bundles, though, that were formed when the stem first grew have been broken up, and they're not really discernible now. The only thing that we can clearly see are the fibrous caps from where they used to be. Going further out to the outside of the phloem, we still have cortex, which is similar to before, and on the very outside, um, if this is a young stem, then we're going to still have epidermis as well. The result of secondary growth in both gymnosperms and dicots is the formation of wood. Wood specifically is secondary xylem tissue. The phloem doesn't contribute to the hard part that we would use for anything. The phloem would be further outside of this, and it's been removed in this picture. We can distinguish between two kinds of wood, and this is important if you're building something. If you were to go to a lumber yard, they would ask, are you looking for hardwood or are you looking for softwood? So let's talk about what that means. Starting with hardwood, this is the wood that comes, comes from angiosperms, and it's called hardwood because fibers are present, and all else being equal, having more fibers in the wood makes it harder. Gymnosperms do not make fibers interspersed with their xylem, and so their wood is going to be called softwood because fibers are absent. Now your book gives a caveat, which is correct, that there's actually some softwoods, so woods that lack fibers, that are really quite hard, and there's some hardwoods which have fibers, but they're really quite soft. So these terms are by no means perfect as descriptions, but generally speaking, most hardwoods are harder than most softwoods. And at a lumber yard, most of the softwood you would buy is pine, and that pine is definitely softer than most of the hardwoods they would sell. Now, if you look at a cut um, stump or the cut end of a log, you will see banding patterns. And those bands actually tell us something about the age of the tree. The reason for this is that vessel members within the xylem, the, the large xylem transport cells, um, their size is going to vary with the season. Early in the season, when water is abundant, then the plant makes large uh, vessels, or wide vessels, I should say, in order to maximize the amount of water that can move up the tree. But the problem with wide vessels, which we'll talk about later in the course, is that they are more easily interrupted by um, air pockets, which are a bad thing. So as the season progresses and it gets drier and drier out, the plant finds it more favorable to make smaller and smaller vessels. The result of this is that within a given year, we see wide vessels slowly supplanted by smaller vessels. And then by the end of the year, we see a layer of fibers um, without much, and that sort of clearly demarcates the edge 
of one growth year and the start of the next growth year. So if you take a look at the stem, you should be able to pretty quickly figure out how old the stem is. And you can see here's one year, two years, and three years. So this stem has gone through three years of secondary growth. The next thing I want you to notice is that if you look at a stump or you look at the cut end of a piece of wood, you will likely see these spoke-like lines running from somewhere near the center out towards the edges. These are called rays, and that's because they radiate outwards much like the sun's rays. These rays are made from parenchyma, and they serve an important function. The ray cells are elongate. However, they are elongate in the opposite direction um, as the vessel members or vessel elements. While vessel elements are elongate and go up and down the stem, the rays instead go horizontally from inside towards the outside of the stem in this direction. They are made by the vascular cambium um, at the same time that the new xylem is made or the new phloem. And the picture here is emphasizing the rays in the xylem, but they would continue out into the phloem. So just to emphasize this, the orientation of the rays is inward and outward, not upward and downward. And these are here largely to perform localized transport. So within the xylem, while the xylem cells at maturity are not alive, there are going to be parenchyma cells in here um, as well. And also during development, these cells would need a source of uh, nutrition. So by having rays, material can be transported into the xylem or out into the phloem. These rays can transport water, minerals, and sugars, for example, as well as other organic compounds. The rays can also serve a defensive purpose. Um, they can contain toxic substances to prevent infection by fungi or bacteria or to deter herbivores from burrowing into the wood. So we're going to move on now and look at a cut stem that is several years old. As I recall, it was somewhere around 26 years old. And this is actually a branch off of a yew tree. You can see first that there's many concentric rings and if you count them, that would tell you the age of this branch, which is somewhere in the mid-20s. The next thing that I want you to notice is that some of this wood is fairly light in color, and the rest of it is fairly dark. In the very center is a very dark area. That is the pith from the original branch. Then if we look at this next area that's still pretty dark, then this is going to be the heartwood. And heartwood is wood in the center of the tree that has stopped functioning. So within this region, the xylem has all either become plugged or it has developed air bubbles, which makes it non-functional. This xylem would be a tube going up and down the tree, and it would make the tree susceptible to infection. For example, if a fungus got into the xylem, then it would have a fairly clear path up and down the tree. So to prevent this, when vessel members cease functioning, let's say because an air bubble forms, then the parenchyma cells near them create plugs, and those plugs then stop that from being a clear path up and down the tree, and those plugs are also causing the change in color that we see here. So the wood in the middle, um, closer to the center, is the heartwood, and that's non-functional. The wood that has been created more recently is the wood towards the outside, and this is going to have active movement of liquid through it. That liquid that moves through the xylem is called sap, and so this is called the sap wood. In other words, it's the wood that still has sap flowing. On that branch that we were just looking at, it ended with the xylem being the outside. But in reality, if you look at a branch um, that hasn't been prepared, you're going to see additional layers. And one of those layers is going to be the bark. 
the bark is contributed to by an additional layer of cambium that we haven't talked about yet. So we've talked already about the vascular cambium, which would be in this region here where I'm moving the mouse between the xylem and the phloem. However, this additional layer of cambium is much closer to the edge of the um, stem. And the cells that are going to be made from the cork cambium are cork cells. Cork cells have a layer of waterproof coating. It's a slightly different substance than coudin, but it accomplishes the same thing. It's protection from fungi and bacteria, as well as a way to waterproof the outside of the stem. So bark itself is actually a combination of old phloem that has become non-functional and has started to slough off in these pieces, combined with the cork created by the cork cambium. And different kinds of trees have different textures of bark, and it's one way that um, botanists or foresters can tell apart different tree species. This is one of my favorite barks. This bark comes from hackberry or Celtis, um, which is a fairly common tree in this area. To me, it looks like topographic maps with, you can see, many different layers of bark um, sort of sticking out and creating a rough surface. By the time bark is formed, the epidermis has long since broken up and is no longer able to completely cover the tree. So at this point, bark is really taking on that role. There's a problem with having a waterproof covering on the outside of the stems. That is that there are living cells inside, and those cells need to perform respiration. Respiration requires gas, and so if there was an airtight covering from suberin, then there wouldn't be any access to gas, and those cells would eventually die. So we've mentioned lenticels before in the context of features of twigs. Here we can talk about what lenticels do. These are going to be openings in the bark that allow gas exchange. Therefore, respiration can happen, and those living cells inside can survive. Now, lenticels come with a cost. They are openings through which fungi or other microbes can penetrate, but they are a necessary cost if the wood is going to, or if the stem is going to remain alive. So some final thoughts from this lecture. First, We've seen that stems have mechanisms both for vertical as well as horizontal transport. And we're used to thinking about the vertical transport through phloem and xylem. But it's important to remember that the rays are allowing very localized horizontal transport as well. Second, remember that the organization of the vasculature relates to the ability of the stem to widen. And this is um, clear when you think about the difference in organization of the monocots versus dicots and the two reasons we talked about that monocot stems cannot widen while dicot stems can. Third, remember that stems need to balance transport with needs for defense and so we saw that there is xylem and phloem for transport but we also saw parenchyma cells that can contain deterrence to herbivores We've also seen the formation of first the epidermis and later the cork, which forms bark, which are used to protect the stem.